The words to which I'd call your attention this morning are found in Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he is calling for salvation. He is not talking about some higher level for people that are already saved. Notice he's speaking to the crowds in, at large and he's saying, if anybody wants to follow me, anybody, young, old, Jew, Gentile, male, female, Americans, if anybody wants to follow me, let him deny himself. Now, you've probably heard messages on this verse. I know I've preached on it several times in this place and elsewhere. We've heard about what it means to uh, desire to come after him and to follow him and to even take up our cross. I wonder how often you've heard a message on the middle phrase, let him deny himself. Self-denial is a very important Biblical principle. In fact, when you look at it in context here, it's an essential condition to become a Christian. If anybody wants to follow me, this is a call to become a Christian. That's how important it is. Thomas Watson, the great Puritan, said, There may be going to heaven without comfort, but there is no going to heaven without self-denial. To be a disciple is to be a Christian. And to be a disciple, Jesus says right here, you have to deny yourself. Now, someone will say, isn't that, that adding to the condition of salvation? Don't we believe it's by faith alone? Yes, but when you look at it properly, faith alone means faith and not works. Self-denial is not a work. Any more than repentance is. Actually, it's a part of repentance and part of faith. To become a Christian, Jesus says you must deny yourself. But also, to continue to follow the Lord, Jesus involves continual self-denial. And you never follow the Lord Jesus Christ any more than you deny yourself. So let's see what that means. That's the morning message on self-denial. First, as I often do, let me tell you what it does not mean. And I'm going to just say that very briefly. For some people think self-denial means you deny yourself certain things that you want. I grew up in New Orleans, which is overwhelmingly Roman Catholic. And most of my friends as a little boy were Catholics. And toward the end of February, you always heard the children at the playground saying, what are you giving up for Lent? What are you going to deny yourself? I'm giving up bubble gum for Lent. And I wonder what's the spiritual value of that. Or I'm giving up this or that. I'm not going to watch my favorite cartoon on TV. That's not what Jesus means when he says deny yourself. Nor does he mean deny the necessities of life. Jesus doesn't ask us to starve to death to become a Christian. Nor is he talking about legitimate pleasures or activities. It says over in Timothy that, there, that God has made all foods for us to eat and to enjoy with thanksgiving. So he's not saying just give up delicious food or activities. Nor is he talking about the sacrifices that we normally make. For example, parents will deny them certain things for the sake of their children. An athlete will deny himself certain legitimate things to be a better athlete. That's not what Jesus has in view here. Jesus is not asking us to deny things to ourselves. He is asking us to deny ourself to ourself, which is even harder to do. Nor is Jesus talking about the Buddhist idea of losing your personal identity into the great all of nothingness. That sounds very profound, but it's actually nonsense. That's not what Jesus is saying when he says deny yourself. But it is very obvious what he does mean when he says deny yourself. He is not talking about self-esteem, self-worth, or self-love. Self-denial is the polar opposite of those three. Now, I realize that is 
very politically incorrect. Not long ago, I saw some documentary on television. They're interviewing uh, educators and teachers. And they said, what is the number one task uh, that you have? And they said, oh, it's to instill self-esteem in the children. And the interviewer said, I thought it was to teach the children mathematics and reading and history and so on. No, no, it's self-esteem and self-worth and you can do it and you're good. Self-esteem, self-worth are very popular today. But as we will see, it's the exact opposite of what the Bible says. The Bible says God's ways are not our ways and God's ways are certainly not the world's ways. Self-denial. What does it mean? Well, it hinges upon the word deny. Just a little four-letter word. Deny. It means to renounce, to refuse, to disown, to betray. You could even just change one letter. To deny means to defy, means to be the opposite of something, to go against it. And the opposite of this word, to deny, means to cling to, to acknowledge, to give allegiance to. So you could say to deny means to say no to. And the opposite means to say yes to. And to understand this, let's look at three instances in the Bible. First, turn back to Matthew chapter 10. Because to understand the word, we need to see not just what the dictionaries say, but how is it used in the Bible itself. So look there, Matthew chapter 10, starting in verse 32. O Lord Jesus Christ says, therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. So you can see in these verses that uh, a person either confesses or denies Christ and that they are opposites. And being opposites, you can see that they define each other. To confess here means... Not just to confess sin. To confess sin simply means to admit, yes, I am a sinner. But here it's talking about confessing Christ. Meaning, to openly acknowledge allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. To say yes to him. And that implies that you are saying no to everything else, including yourself. It says here, however, if someone denies Christ. And that means they ignore Christ, they oppose Christ, they renounce Christ, and there's no in-between. So, whose side are you on? Now, that helps us define what deny and confess means. Well, let's go a little bit deeper there. We must deny ourselves in order to confess Jesus Christ. That's where you compare Scripture with Scripture. We have to deny ourselves and we have to confess the Lord Jesus. But there's no in-between. You have to do both. We must deny ourselves in order to confess Jesus and uh, Jesus Christ. Not to confess Christ is to deny Christ. There's no neutrality. Jesus said, whoever is not with me is against me. So if you deny Christ, you're not confessing him. There's no in between. But that's where we bring in self-denial. A famous preacher once said, you deny Christ when you fail to deny yourself for Christ. If you say, well, I'm not going to deny Christ, I, I confess Christ, I accept him, I follow him, but I'm not going to deny myself. No, no, no. The two go together. You deny yourself and you confess Christ. Now, the second instance is found in all four Gospels, and you don't have to turn there. It's when Jesus said to Peter, Peter, are you going to follow me? Oh, yes, Lord, I will follow you. No, Peter, tonight... You are going to deny me. There's the word again. You're going to deny me three times tonight. And Peter said, oh, not me. Others may, but not old Peter. I will never deny you. Well, we know the rest of the story. He did deny the Lord Jesus Christ. He denied knowing Jesus. He denied that he was a follower of Jesus. And when that little girl came to him that night and said, you're one of his followers. Peter should have said, yes, I am. I confess him. I follow him. I love him. But instead, he says, I don't know the man. But so far as himself, he should have said, I deny myself. I'm nobody. I'm just Peter. He should have stepped forward and say, I'm nobody. I deny myself, but I confess Christ. But he didn't. 
And the third instance is found the very next day on Good Friday when we're told that the Jewish leaders moved the crowds to deny Christ. Acts 3.14, Peter later accused them and said, you denied the Holy One and called for a murderer. And what happened was this. Pontius Pilate gave them a choice between two people. Barabbas, a thief, a murderer, no good, a terrorist. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who was more than just a rabbi, he was one without sin, he was a son of God. So he put the choice to the people and said, which one will you have? As if to say, which one will you confess? Which one will you deny? And what did the crowds say? They said, well, we will not have this man, Jesus, to rule over us. And they even got the crowds to say, we have no king but Caesar. They said, well, what about Jesus? Well, crucify him, crucify him. And they got their way. Now, here's a a good principle. When you study the Bible and see what someone does wrong, like what we said about Peter, ask yourself, what should they have done instead? The crowd should have said, no, we don't call for Barabbas, we call for Christ. They should have said something like, we will have Jesus rule over us. We have no king but Jesus. Crown him, not crucify him. So you see, they did the exact Opposite. They deny Jesus. And in the same way, we should use that example and say, Lord, not crucify him. Crucify me. I deny myself, not him. I will not have me rule over me. I have no king but Jesus, not me. Crown him, not me. But we tend to imitate the Jews in doing the wrong thing. So we confuse Confessing and denying. Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said, No man can serve two masters, not Christ and yourself. We have to deny ourselves as being our king and say, I'm taking the crown off of my head and putting it at his feet. I deny myself. We cannot have two masters. And there's no neutrality. Jesus said you have to deny yourself. Now, what is it about ourselves that we must deny? Let me give you two verses on this. Titus 2.12, we're told, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. So we should deny ungodliness. And of course, there again, we look at the opposite. We should accept godliness. There's no in-between. We should go from one to the other. Denying ungodliness. Now, When Jesus said this, deny, if he would have said, deny sin, turn from sin, every Pharisee in the country would have said, that's right. We shouldn't be like those dirty Gentiles or even these Jews that are acting like Gentiles. We should deny ungodliness. And the Pharisees would have stepped forward and said, Jesus, that's us. We have done that. It's easy to see that. But it's not so easy to see the heart of what Jesus meant. And for that, I ask you to turn over to Philippians chapter 3. And this would surprise you because it certainly would surprise the Pharisees. But this was written by an ex-Pharisee Christian named Paul. Look at Philippians 3, starting at verse 7. Now, in the first few verses, he's already, as it were, given his religious pedigree. I was a Jew. I was a Hebrew. The stock of Israel. Benjamite. I was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, etc. Great righteousness. Blameless. But, verse 7. What things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yes, indeed, I count, yet indeed, I count all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from him, which is from God by faith. What's he saying? He is saying, I denied my self-righteousness. As a Pharisee, he wove a garment of pure righteousness and he would hold it up. Oh, he was so proud of it. But when he met Christ, he said, that robe meant nothing. I take the robe and I throw it away. It's no good. That's part of self-denial is denying your self-righteousness. And the holier a person thinks he is, the harder it is for him to do it 
because he thinks this is my ticket to heaven. Look how righteous I am. And there are many people like like that today in the churches, in the synagogues, in the temples, all around the world in different religions. We have to deny our self-righteousness in order to deny ourself. So what do we do? If you're still counting on your deeds of holiness, religiosity, memorizing a catechism, being baptized, anything like that. The Bible says, look at it for what it is. And it says over in the book of Isaiah, all of our righteousness is like filthy rags. It's like some cloth that you're about to throw out and you say, well, you know, I can still use that to wipe up the, the oil underneath my leaky car or that I can shine my shoes with and then I'll throw it away. You're not going to say that. You're not going to put that on a plaque on the wall and say, look how beautiful that dirty rag is. No, you, you throw it away. God tells you to take your rags of righteousness, bundle them up and throw them into the fires of hell. Because they stink before God. They're no good. Deny your self-righteousness. That's why Paul says, I threw it away. I see it's, it's just lost. It's, it's dirty. It's, 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 it's filthy. Deny your self-righteousness. But it's more than that. Jesus is not just saying deny your sins, deny your self-righteousness. Deny your self. Deny that everything that belongs to you. For example, the Bible says you do not belong to yourself. First Corinthians 619, you are not your own. And he's talking there about your bodies. And people will say, I am my own. I belong to myself. That's why, for example, many people defend abortion. Woman has the right to her own body. Your body does not belong to yourself. It belongs to God. And it says in Romans 14, 6, we are not our own, but the Lord. So we have to take... That precious possession, ourself, and say, I do not belong to myself. Myself belongs to God. And that includes everything about yourself, your will. And that's something that is hard for us to give up. We want to cling to it and say, I want to do whatever I want to. I am the master of my fate and the captain of my ship. I do what I jolly well please to do. And that's the very antithesis of self-denial. Can you see why this is so utterly astounding and challenging? Not just to the modern mindset. It's been like that since the Garden of Eden. Every sinful human being wants to be numero uno. We say, I do what I choose to do. Nobody tells me what I want to do. Even as little children, we balk at that. and We say to our parents, no, I don't want to clean my room. I want to do what I want to do. And so when we look around the world, look at history, and we see tyranny, we say tyranny is wrong. Why? Because, well, all power resides in human beings, and those that rule, rule at the behest of those that are ruled, and we can overthrow them, we can vote them in. Why? Because I have the right to choose what I want to do. Whereas there was an old song that kept repeating these three words, I, me, mine. And that's the essence of self. And Jesus said, you have to deny that. And you say, how can you? That's me. That's what Jesus said to deny everything about you, your will. And we see that in the Bible, the best example of self-denial in Jesus. Now, you've heard me say this dozens, if not hundreds of times. The best example of everything good, godly, and holy is in Jesus. And so when he said, deny yourself, he's given us the example. He denied his own will at the hardest possible time. Night before he was crucified, Garden of Gethsemane, he held up, as it were, the cup of God's wrath and saw the pain and the punishment he would have to suffer. And he said, if there's any way out, let me take away the cup. He knew there was no other way. He came to drink the cup. So he said, Not my will, but thine. He was denying his own human will before the Father. And that's what we should do. When we deny ourself, we're denying our will and saying, not my will, not myself, but thy will be done. We are to deny our own mind, our plans, our belongings, our everything. And even this little trophy we cling to called our Ambition. What we want to do. The world is filled with that. 
We always want to do something to get the adulation and respect of other people. Some ambition to be the first, the best, the most. We have the desire to be admired by other people. Girls enter beauty contests to be Miss America or Miss World to be the most beautiful one. Boys want to excel at sports. We want to be very intelligent, anything, some area of endeavor. Why? So other people can applaud us and respect us, be envious of us as we are of others. We see someone that's faster, stronger, more beautiful, has better clothes, a better car. Oh, we envy them, so we want to be like that and have other people envy us. That's self crying out to be number one. That's ambition. Medieval theologians said that is one of the seven deadly sins. We want the honors, the acclaim, the applause. We want people to look at us and say, look at him go by. Oh, I wish I was like that. That is self. And we've lived our whole lives like that. We want to be number one. And we've got a good example of this for the last 14 days. Anybody watch the Olympics? Why do they sacrifice so much to go to the Olympics? You say, what's sinful about running in a race or swimming in a, in a pool or something like that? Of itself, nothing, but... You know why most of them did it. In fact, when they were being interviewed, they usually came right out and said it. They said, I've been training ever since I was a little boy or a little girl. And I I did this. I did without. uh, Some of those swimmers would swim several hours a day for years. The track stars, they would exercise almost till they'd pass out. Why? And they would interview them. They said, I gave up all this with the hopes that I would get that gold medal and stand on the podium. And everybody would cheer me and I would be number one. That's, they were admitting it was for self to get the medal, to stand on the podium. Occasionally you'll hear one of them say, well, I did it for God. I wonder how many of them really were doing it for God. But it's for self. And whether it's at the Olympics or at your business or in some other thing, people do that to get that gold medal. To get that commendation at work. John Wesley once said, the real value of something is the price it will bring in eternity. Think of all those gold medals at the Olympics. Oh boy, that thing is worth more than the, you know, $225 an ounce or whatever the price of gold is these days. What's it going to be worth in hell? Nothing. It'll all be melted away. It'll be left back in the grave on earth. They can't bring it to hell with them. Won't matter anything. What about persons? Well, at least I got the reputation. I won the gold medal. I was on such and such a team. You go to hell, hardly anybody there is going to know about you. And even those that remembered you are not going to care. It's not going to matter at all. It's certainly not going to matter in heaven. So why do we do this? People do it for self. You know, they had the Olympics in Paul's days, and Paul said some people run for this perishable olive branch they're going to wear on their head. It's going to perish. And he says, but we run a different race. And he said, we should run to get a different prize. And that prize is something that we can give to the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. We run for a completely different reason. What am I getting at? Ambition is simply a symptom of this Self that we have, we we seek for great things and adulation, maybe to get our name or a picture in the paper on the Internet. Maybe we can excel and maybe even get to meet the president or something like that, or a trophy, a plaque, something. You say, what's wrong with that? Why do you do it? Let me give you a verse. Maybe you've heard this verse. Jeremiah 45, 5. Do you seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them. Notice the words that he uses there. Do you seek great things for yourself? Nothing's wrong with seeking them for God. But when we seek great things for ourselves, we need to deny that. And God says, do not seek them. Seek great things for God. If you want to run the Olympics, why not imitate Eric Liddell, who ran for the glory of God and after the Olympics... He didn't glory and go all around the world showing off. He went to China as a missionary and died as a missionary in relative obscurity. Run, work, do all for the glory of God, not for yourself. The Bible says, if any man glory, let him glory in God, 
Not in yourself. That's what it means to deny self. We're born self-centered. That's part of our sin. That's part of ourselves. But the Bible calls upon us to be God-centered. So when Jesus said, let him deny himself, I'm sure people out there said, did I hear him properly? Deny myself? What's wrong with this? Jesus said nothing wrong with it of itself. But you have to put God first in everything. We are to be God-centered. I hope you looked at the little sign in front of our church. We change the message every week or two. Did you notice the message this week? It's not all about you. It's all about God. And that goes square against the philosophy of the world and against the selfishness in which we are born. We're the center of our own universe. But we're wrong. This is my father's world. He is the center of it. And so what Jesus is saying is deny yourself. Deny that place of being the center of the universe. Step off to the side and put Jesus Christ in his rightful place at the center. God is the only one who has the right to be self-centered. Did you know that? I remember talking with a young lady and saying that God created everything for his own glory. Everything is predestined for his own glory. It's all for everything is by God, for God. And she said, that sounds awfully selfish. And she kind of stuck out her tongue. Ooh, that's bad. That selfishness is bad. And I said, God's the only one that has the right to be selfish and self-centered. Not us. And she says, well, if it's right for God, why is it wrong for us? I said, because we're not God. We have to realize we are not God. We must bow before God. God has the only right to be self-centered. And he is. Therefore, brethren, when we put ourself first, that is self-idolatry. We are claiming a right that belongs only to our maker. We are not to be self-centered, but God-centered in all things. God is self-centered. God has allegiance to nobody but himself. And therefore, God does not deny himself. Here's an interesting verse. Second Timothy 2.13 says he cannot deny himself. God cannot cease to be God-centered. God calls upon us to be God-centered and to deny ourselves. But God cannot deny himself. Ah, but because we're sinners, we're selfish sinners, we go through life denying God. And not ourself. We confess ourself. I'm the master of my ship, the, 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 the captain of my own life. But in doing that, we are denying God. Now, there are atheists that deny God's existence, but those are relatively few in the population of the world. But, born within the heart of man is this self-centeredness, and being self-centered... We deny God, not deny necessarily God's existence, but we deny his right to be the center of the universe, including our universe. We deny that. How do I know? Look at, look at Titus 1.16. Listen to what he says. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him. Now, he's not just talking about evil works. Of course, evil works deny God. He denies that God is holy and he has a right to rule over us. Every time we commit a sin, we're saying, I will not have God rule over me in this. I will do what I want to do. I don't care what the Ten Commandments say. That's denying God's right to rule over us. But it's not just in the blatant sins. It's like in self-righteousness, even in good things that are not of themselves wrong. Eating a meal. Drinking a nice soda, going to work, exercising, just the natural things of life. But if we don't do them in a God-centered way, to the glory of God, it becomes self-centered and therefore sin. That's why the Bible says whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all for the glory of God. The Bible says here, In doing works that are not God-centered, we deny God. Now, what is God's attitude toward this? 2 Timothy 2.12 says, if we deny him, he will also deny us. Jesus said, he that does not confess me before men, I will not confess. Well, you could paraphrase that. If they deny me, I will deny them before my Father in heaven and will say, I never knew you. Now, let's get back to this. Go back to Mark chapter 8 again. Because I want to point something out 
out, else out to you. You have to look at this in context. Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. And then you find in a, an explanation in the next verse, verse 35, when he says, for whoever desires to save his life, he's amplifying and building upon what he means by denying yourself and taking up your cross. Verse 35, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. In the context you see here, what he means is to deny yourself, verse 34, is the same as losing yourself, losing your life in verse 35. Now, in verse 34, he used the personal pronoun for his self. But in verse 35 in the Greek, the word for life is the word for soul. Some translations have it as soul. Some is life. It's the same word. It's the word suke. Uh, we get the word psyche or psychology from it. It means your soul, your heart, your inner being, your spirit. And Jesus said you must desire to lose your life and not to save it. If you save it, if you hold on to it, you're going to lose it. But if you give it up, you will gain it. What a paradox. To save your life means to love it and to cling to it and to make it all important in your life. In other words, to be self Centered, And Jesus said, you have to come down from the throne of your heart, of your soul, and let Jesus be on the throne and you at his feet. Jesus said something similar to this in John 12, 25. And again, he changed the verbs to bring out the meaning. meaning. He said this, he who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So then. Look at the verse again. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Therefore, you must deny your life. You must hate your life. But whoever loses his life, whoever denies his soul, for my sake in the gospel, will save it. Now, what does he mean here? To lose your life. Well, it it does include martyrdom. Because when Jesus spoke this, his apostles were there. And 11 of those 12 apostles would die as martyrs. Peter would. He'd be crucified. Jesus predicted that over in John's Gospel. Thomas, over in the Gospel of John, said, let us go to Jerusalem with him and die with him. Not so fast, Thomas. You'll die for Jesus many years later. All of them would die as martyrs, except the Apostle John. Was Jesus saying, therefore, to become a Christian, you have to take up a cross and literally die for him? Not necessarily, but... What if that was the case? Now, now follow me on this. What if Jesus meant that literally? What if Jesus said, if you're going to be my follower, if you're going to be a disciple and get to heaven, if you're going to be saved, have all of your sins forgiven, you will have to die a painful martyr's death on a cross. What if he had said that? I wonder how many in the crowds would have continued to follow him. But, of course, he didn't literally mean that. But what if he did? What if today when we invite people to come to Christ, we'd say, okay, here's the deal. To get to heaven, you have to pick up a cross. You have to be convicted in law court. And they're going to drive nails into your hands. They're going to whip you. Or it's going to be extremely painful. But as you die, you'll go straight to heaven. What if that was the case? Dell. I wonder how many people would come forward at altar calls. But Jesus is actually saying something very similar. He is not saying we have to volunteer to die physically. He is saying that when you come to him, you will die spiritually. You will deny yourself. As it were, you're taking yourself and you're nailing it to a cross. Your soul, your spirit, your ambition, everything about you, you're denying, you're putting it to death. We do die to self. That's why Paul says, I die daily. Now, I might want to quote Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was rather liberal, but he did say something that that fits in in this place. In his book on the call to discipleship, he said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Deny yourself means death to your whole ambitions. 
everything about you, everything that is precious to you, your thoughts, your will, ambition, everything, as it were, you're crucifying and saying, I am denying that. It's like, God, I do not want this. I am accepting Christ and not this. I confess him, not myself. Now you see why it's so radical, this call to discipleship. Now, when we believe in Jesus, we often say, well, we give our hearts to Jesus. We give our soul. We give ourself. Now, earlier in the message, I said, take not only your sins, but your self-righteousness, bind it up and throw it into hell forever. And in the same way, take yourself, your soul, as it were, and say, Lord, I take my all and I give it to you. No questions asked. No strings attached. And that's something that the sinful heart of man just cannot do. We always want to hold back a little bit. We'll give it to him with a, a little piece of string on the end of it saying, you know, this is a conditional 30-day thing. Well, I'll try it, but I can always change my mind later. No, it's an unconditional call, all or nothing. And that includes your very self. And the result is your self no longer belongs to yourself. It doesn't belong to you anymore. That's why the Bible says we are not our own. We belong to him. Some of you know the Heidelberg Catechism. You can probably stand up and recite question and answer number one. But for you that can't, let me read it to you. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is so radically different to the world's thinking and living and feeling that we stand out. We become politically and culturally incorrect. It produces a radical change. We become disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going against the grain. You see, it changes everything in life. It changes, for example, our relationship to other people. We don't have to be number one every time now. We don't mind it when people trample over us. For example, when we've given our self and selfish ambition and self-respect and everything like that to God, it doesn't matter what people think about us anymore. Just think of it like this. They insult you. They call you ugly. Well, you look in the mirror and you say, well, you're right. I am ugly. And if you're not ugly, you just kind of duck and say, well, you're wrong. But I guess in comparison to the angels, I am ugly. You can't, you can't insult a person that has no self anymore. Remember... Thirty-something years ago, hearing a well-known British preacher say this about another man who wasn't present, he said, that man is no longer unselfish. He is selfless. And I've never been able to forget that. It's like he never thinks about himself. It's not just unselfish. He's selfless. That's what happens when we become Christians and we're to strive to be selfless. Less. We become generous, loving. We put other people first. We are now free to be unselfish and selfless. Brethren, self-denial is a key ingredient in discipleship and in spirituality and in following Jesus. Not just becoming a Christian, but to continue to follow him. This is the path our Lord Jesus Christ lays out before us, but it's so often overlooked. No man is more spiritual than his self-denial. You are no more Christian than you have committed yourself to this principle of saying, all for Christ, none for me. Self means nothing. Or as we sing in one of the hymns, I give myself to you. Richard Baxter, the great Puritan, said, no man hath any more holiness than he hath self-denial. He's right. Examine yourselves. Do you really deny yourself? Let me leave you with this thought. The life of self is death. And the death of self is true life. Think about it. Let's pray. Father, you have issued an astounding call to us. It goes against our sinful grain. But you have transformed us and we see that this is the only way it can be, it should be, it must be. 
for you're the only one that deserves to be self-centered. So, Father, we give ourselves to you, our soul, our all. We deny ourselves. And we say Jesus is the one. He is numero uno. He gets all the glory and all the honor. And our ambition in life is to follow him. To love him. All the days of our lives. So that that day may come when this race of life is over and we meet up in heaven. Whatever crowns we have waiting for us. Whatever gold medals. We give to him. And we dare not cling to ourselves. And what an honor it will be to give those trophies to him. In his name we pray. Amen.